Well, hi there, and welcome to our final town hall before Biola begins the 21-22 academic year. We're so glad that you've joined us. And when we get together, it's going to be as one community, in person, on campus, beginning next month. Thanks be to God. You know, tonight we want to provide you with an opportunity to hear from some of Biola's leaders as you prepare to come back to Biola, or for some of you coming for the first time. And we have so much to be grateful for, and this is a happy moment for me to let you know what's on the short horizon. And students, we are preparing for you, and I just want to begin our time right now with just a brief word of prayer, so pray with me if you would. Father, thank you. Uh, for this gathering, people from across the country and around the world thinking and preparing for coming back to Biola, coming to Biola for the first time. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for favor. I pray for uh, your blessing upon these families as they enter into this next season and the end of this long drought that we've been in. Inhabit our conversation today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, students, we are so ready for you, and our staff has been working so hard. Uh, faculty are gearing up for the year to, to teach and advise and research. And, and students, we are determined to bring out the best in you, especially after a long and hard season of being away from each other. And as I've talked to many of you this past year remotely, and, and I can't wait, we can't wait to have you in person, I continue to remind you that at Biola, we are about educating you to become the kind of citizens our world so needs, God's gospel people. I like the way one of our Biola dads, David Kinneman, puts it. He says this, For your generation, the pressing question is how to live faithfully and how to have a life of conviction in a world that overwhelms and steamrolls conviction and belief. You know, this isn't meant to be uh, arrogant, but I, I think Biola helps you live that way, faithfully and flourishingly. At Biola, we help prepare you students with firm convictions and gracious spirits to be wise and effective leaders. You know, hey, we've worked uh, nonstop this past year to provide you the education that you've needed during the pandemic. And now we are again pivoting, parting the overuse of that word, uh, and our teams are on campus preparing for your arrival. Faculty are prepping for their courses, and they will be teaching most all of you in person beginning the end of August. Thanks be to God. You know, we're preparing for our uh, facilities to be in great shape. Our residence halls are being refreshed. The grounds and gardens are green and flowering. A Chase Gymnasium, not far from here, has undergone major renovations in support of our outstanding NCAA Division II athletic programs. We have a brand new weight room and training room and another round of renovations starting soon in the gym. We even, even expanded our power plant in anticipation of serving you with electricity and heat and cooling as we begin Biola's 114th year. Right now, we're coming to you live at the newly renovated Bardwell Hall. It's now housing our Department of Visual Arts, which was just completed a few months ago. Now it's fully operational as we prepare to begin the fall semester. And this beautiful facility in the center of our campus, it's going to create new opportunities for the role of the visual arts in the life of the university. The new studios and galleries and classrooms and art labs and more will expand the curricular scope and offerings of the art department. And this facility is one of the many reasons we're so thrilled for fall 2021 to finally be here. And we're going to dedicate this building and its activities in a chapel service in the beginning of September. So we're preparing for the early arrival right now with some of our students. We've got a number of first gen students coming early in August for their orientation. More than 60 new undergraduate global students are going to arrive the week prior to move-in week. We have athletes and RAs and Tory Honors college students and others coming in mid-August. And, and then for those living on campus, move-in day is a little more than a month away. And we're going to be so prepared to welcome all our new incoming students, those who are living on campus and those who are commuters. And we're going to be welcoming those moving in on August the 26th. We're going to welcome returning students on August the 27th to the 29th. And, and we have some great activities and events to greet you as you begin the new academic year. And we also know it's been a tough year, a tough year for many of you. And we're going to be mindful of this and care for you deeply. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Last year's incoming class of 2020, you didn't get to experience new student orientation. So I want you to know we haven't forgotten you. We have a slate of onboarding programs available for you as well. 
and every student, incoming, returning freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, as well as graduate students. Every one of you experienced some degree of loss last year, so we're gonna make our welcome week extra special this year. And so we encourage you to participate in the programs designed for you. And then the big kickoff will be the first day of class, so August 30th, at our fall convocation, right on Metzger Lawn, just behind me over there. And the full schedule of activities is gonna be coming to you in short order. You know, we've not just been preparing for you, we've, we've been praying for you. We have this united 120 days of prayer, this campaign that began in early May. And imagine that, 120 days, that's 360 meals. And during that time, we have people fasting and praying for you. Every meal is covered, many of them multiple times with faculty and staff, trustees, donors, alumni, praying and fasting over our students for God's blessing, for his favor, for his anointing to be on our campus. And let me end with a reminder that we are a university that's fully committed to our founding vision, now 113 years on. Though we're a, a modern and relevant university, accredited and thriving, we're also a faithful university. This past year during COVID, I've, I've delved deeply into our history, asking myself why our founders established Biola and if their early vision still mattered today. And I've become certain of a couple of things. First, I have rediscovered what was important to our founders. And second, I've concluded that what they had in mind in 1908 is still relevant to our students in this moment. You know, we may be doing things differently, but the soul of Biola has not changed, 113 years strong. And this is important for me to tell you today at this town hall, as we're not giving up on our convictions, even though we are developing new modes of delivery and establishing additional programs and building or enhancing facilities and preparing our students for meaningful careers when they graduate. So you might ask, well, like, what were those first Biola principles that we're still uniting around as we move into the future? Well, in 30 seconds, here they are. One is a commitment to students to learn and love the truths of Scripture deeply. God's Word, it matters. A second is a commitment for students to develop the life of the mind and patterns of thought. It's a commitment to nurture our students as disciples of Jesus, caring about the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. It's commitment to instilling in our students a virtuous life of character and, and habits of the heart. And it's commitment to being a reconciling community where everyone is welcomed here. And I'm confident that when our founders established Biola, they did so with the hope and expectation that when they were old and gray and sitting in rock and chairs somewhere, they would know they invested in a generation of remarkable students who live well into these principles, these timeless and good ideals and that's still our hope for you today. That's our expectation. And this is what brought me to Biola from Boston 15 years ago this month. And it's what keeps me here. It keeps all of us here. And we do this for you, students. And parents, we do this for your sons and your daughters. Okay, so enough for me. You're going to hear some stories from leaders tonight on the, the details of how we're going to be opening in just a few weeks. But I want to begin with a big picture of why. So thanks for indulging me on that. I'm done. Okay, before I turn this over to our expert team of leaders, whom I'm so honored to work alongside, I want to share what we're going to address tonight during our hour together. You'll be hearing from several of my colleagues tonight, including Dr. Tammy Anderson, Associate Provost of Academic Effectiveness and Administration on what to expect academically. You'll hear from Dr. Andre Stevens, Vice President for Student Development and Chair of our Bio University Reopening Team on Student Life and County Guidelines. You'll hear from Sandy Huff, Dean of Community Life and our Title IX Coordinator on social gatherings, co-curricular activities, and student orientation. Mike Ons here, Assistant Dean of Chapels and Worship. He's going to share about chapels for the fall semester and some of the speakers for students to look forward to. Of course, John Ojesikoba, Chief of Campus Safety, is going to answer some of your questions about safety on our campus. And we'll save some time for Q&A facilitated by Brenda Velasco, Senior Director of University Communications. So that's it for me until we get to some questions, but Dr. Anderson, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you again for all of you joining tonight, and Dr. Anderson, you are live. Yes, thank you all for uh, uh, being here. Here we are out in sunny Southern California in the early evening. It's just wonderful. Um, it's, uh, my remarks will cover information related specifically to academics. Uh, regarding course instruction, all traditional classes will resume in-person instruction this fall. 
while online courses that were pre-designed as online will continue in the online format. In terms of classroom experience, as of today, no physical distancing or face coverings are required for students. Of course, students can choose to wear face covering if they feel more comfortable doing so. Faculty and staff are governed by separate guidelines than students. These guidelines require faculty and staff who are not vaccinated to wear masks. In my conversations with faculty, it is clear how excited they are to be in person with their students. Mm -hmm. Not only for classes, but also for the more informal mentoring that takes place on campus. It is not uncommon for faculty to grab coffee with a student or share a meal together to discuss a recent lecture or just life. Mm -hmm. In closing, I would like to mention some exciting news regarding new hires. I don't have time to, to mention all of it, uh, but uh, there is some exciting things around new hires and programming. This fall, we will have seven new full-time faculty starting in various programs across the university. Just as an example, we have a full-time faculty member beginning in the School of Cinema and Media Arts who has received three Emmy nominations and has worked for Disney and Nickelodeon. Regarding new programs, Biola will launch eight new programs this fall, such as a bachelor's degree in early childhood education, a master's degree in public health, and an online bachelor of science program in Bible, theology, and apologetics. As I mentioned earlier, we are really excited to have our students back and look forward to welcoming them into both existing and new programs. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Andre Stevens, the Vice President for Student Development and Chair of our reopening team. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, and good evening, students and family members tuning in tonight. And I want to say a special welcome to our first year incoming students. Uh, I have a privilege of leading the Division of Student Development, which encompasses spiritual development, our chapel programming, student ministries and pastoral care, community life, which is our housing and residence life programs, veterans and military affiliated students, campus engagement, which includes our student clubs and new student orientation, global student programs and development in Title IX, and then athletics and student wellness, uh, which has our student health center. Uh, Sarah Templeton, our director, is not here tonight, uh, but she's done a phenomenal job. Our learning center and student care and conduct, conduct. So together, more than ever, we are excited to welcome you back to campus this fall. And as Dr. Corey mentioned, the team has been preparing for your safe and successful return or transition if you're new to our campus. I've also had the honor to lead our campus repopulation team, a team of staff and faculty from across campus dedicated in preparing for your safe return to campus this fall. We are thrilled and grateful that the LA County guidelines and protocols as of last month have been lifted. The county guidelines are now mostly recommendations that align with the CDC. As such, we anticipate a full return to campus with no capacity limits or distancing protocols in the residence halls, the classrooms, campus eateries, the bookstore and library are also currently open for students and visitors. The fitness center will reopen in the fall and currently our facilities team is moving furniture back into the residence halls, the classroom spaces, they're updating our signage, they've removed the caution tape that has kept the six foot distancing and turning on the drinking fountains. Ooh. So when you arrive on campus, you will notice hand sanitizer stations throughout the campus and cleaning and disinfecting procedures will continue that go beyond the CDC recommendations. We do continue to recommend students to be vaccinated, although it is not required, as you know from Biola. The CDC and LA County states that being vaccinated is still the best protection against COVID-19 and the significant health issues related to COVID. The Student Health Center will have vaccines available to, Bi to the Biola community starting in mid-August, if you're interested. And regardless of vaccination status, students will not have to wear masks indoors or outdoors. However, some students may voluntarily desire to wear a face covering. You certainly are free to do so, and I trust our community will be supportive of those who do. We are also not requiring students to COVID test before they arrive on campus. However, students who show symptoms of COVID-19 should delay their arrival to campus. 
During the fall, the health center will conduct symptomatic, symptomatic testing as needed. We also have a number of rooms set aside for quarantine if necessary. And we're recommending that students, that you report your vaccination status in order for our health center to understand herd immunity, the need for testing and quarantine and isolation if exposure does happen. This will happen through the registration process. If COVID-19 cases remain relatively low and we have decent vaccine rates, we will not be conducting surveillance testing. However, I've used a lot of howevers in this, <laughs> uh, but however, if we have to do surveillance testing, it would likely only be for unvaccinated students. The Biola team will continue to monitor the situation, especially with the Delta variant, and make any adjustments to our guidelines as necessary. We are anticipating a robust, robust return to campus with full engagement in the activities and co-curricular programming that some of you are familiar with, as well as new engagements that emerge from your input throughout the year. In just a few moments, you will hear from Mike Ahn, Assistant Dean of Chapels and Worship, on our chapel programming, and Sandy Huff, Dean of Community Life, will answer your questions on housing, new student orientation, and welcome week. For you second year students, and Dr. Corey mentioned this, and parents who last year was your first year at Biola, we are including you in most of our welcome week activities, and we're excited about that. You can jump on, on the orientation website to register. We want this to be a special uh, occasion for you and your family, uh, and especially get the welcome that you missed last year. Finally, one of the hallmarks of a Biola education is the student life experience. The co-curricular education ac activities that you participate in outside the classroom. Again, you can look forward to some of our traditional events returning like Nation Ball and Mock Rock, cheering on our athletic teams, being involved in student clubs and ministries and other co-curricular educational programming in the residence hall or through the collegium for co commuter students. We'll be back and with your help, be better than ever. Mm -hmm. For those new students who have never heard of Biola's Nation Ball or Mock Rock, these are traditions that you'll learn more about when you get to campus. Right. We're excited to see your smiling faces back on campus. We're committed to transitioning you back uh, to campus well, connecting you, you with your peers and providing meaningful educational experiences that support your growth and whole holistic development. Thank you again. Now let me hand it over to my friend and colleague, Mike Ahn, to share about this year's chapel pro programming. Thanks, Dr. Stevens. It's an honor to serve under you in student development. Well, at Biola, we learn together, we eat together in the CAF, we gather together in residence halls or in the collegium. So it only makes sense that we worship together as well. We're returning to our full eight chapel a week program where we invite your student, our students, to important spiritual rhythms in the Christian faith, like musical worship, prayer, and of course, the pro proclamation of God's word. Remember, full-time students are required to attend 20 chapels over the course of the semester, but there will be over 150 opportunities for them to fulfill that commitment. I wanna to touch briefly on the different kinds of chapels we offer every week. Most are the typical preaching-driven worship service, but we also have guided prayer chapels, musical worship chapels, student testimony, and even interview-style chapels. We offer these different kinds of chapels because we recognize not only are our students coming from various places around the globe, but from various Christian traditions, stages of faith, and learning styles. Our chapel theme for the year is known, as in knowing God's self and others, and being known by God's self and others. It's been a year where many of us have been remote, not only in our work and learning, but also in our relationships. We've suffered a distance, an isolation, and a separation from the presence of others. We have literally been out of touch. So this year's chapel theme invites us into a biblical landscape of words, images, and ideas filled with the presence that God offers us through the knowledge of Him, ourselves, and others. In the middle of the fall semester, your student will pause classes to participate in the Tory Memorial Bible Conference. Two of our keynote speakers this year will be Dr. Kyle Strobel, who teaches spiritual theology here, and Pastor Matt Chandler, pastor of the Village Church in Texas. We're excited for how the Holy Spirit will lead us in this time. One last thing, right after the to Tory Memorial Bible Conference, Biola is hosting the inaugural Ablaze Conference for the Biola community and the local community. 
There will be lots of workshops and events, but I want to highlight the Jesus People concert that will be happening on Friday, October 9, featuring some of the pioneers in Christian music like Love Song, The Salt Company, Honey Tree, and Second Chapter of Acts. Registration will open at the end of July. Dr. Corey, I'm going to hand it back to you and lead us in the Q&A portion. Great. Thanks, uh, Mike. On. So it's time to answer your questions. And so we've tried to integrate some of the, we had a lot of questions that came in, integrate some of the answers and comments that we just gave you. Um, so, but we're gonna address some of the questions that are specific uh, right now. And I just do wanna say as a disclaimer that what we're gonna be sharing with you is information that we have today. So we're also taking note that the chat questions that you submit, uh, we're gonna try to incorporate these uh, into our FAQs and we regularly update them along the way. So thanks for submitting your questions and uh, Brenda Velasco is now going to read the questions and then call on one of us to respond. Brenda, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corey, and good evening. From everywhere that you're tuning in, I see um, Alaska, Mexico, Singapore, um, Texas, uh, Nigeria. So thank you for tuning in from all around the world. We're so glad that you're here with us this, mm. this evening um, in sunny uh, California. So it is actually pretty hot here on, on top of this patio. But the first question is for Sandy Huff, the Dean of Community Life and Title IX Coordinator. Uh, the question is, can I finally decrease my meal plan and will the kitchens be open in the residence halls? Great, thank you for that question. It's good to be with you all tonight. Uh, it is good news. The hall, the residence hall kitchens have all reopened. That happened again around the June 15th time where we opened that up. So if students are currently here and wish to decrease their meal plan, they certainly can do so. Just to note, all residence hall residents um, for the fall, whether full or part-time, are required to purchase a minimum of a 10 meal plan per week. So you can see more of that information on the website if you need to. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this next question is for Andre. I'm a current student. I was going through the guidelines uh, with COVID-19 for the fall and saw that fully vaccinated faculty is not required to wear a mask indoors. Does this apply for fully vaccinated students as well? Yes, thank you, Brenda. Yes, students will not have to wear face coverings indoors or outdoors regardless of vaccination status. However, students may voluntarily choose to wear face covering if they want. However, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Um, this next question is from Mike. Are there still going to be options to do remote chapels? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to embrace the full in-person uh, full, full, <clears throat> full in college experience, and chapels will be included in there as well. So we're not going to be offering remote chapels for students unless you are a traditional undergraduate student who has been temporarily approved for full remote, remote coursework. There are only a few students who are approved for this and we'll be in touch with you in how to proceed. Great, thanks Mike. Uh, this next question is for Andre. Has Biola removed the requirement for flu shots for students on campus? Yeah, thank you, great question. The flu shot was a county requirement last year for those students who were on campus uh, due to the surge of COVID-19 cases in the county. We have not heard that the county will require flu shots again this year. Thanks, Andre. This question's for Sandy. Are there rules for the fall dorms about roommates and vaccines? My daughter's vaccinated, but her chosen roommate is not. Will they be moved? So just as we mentioned earlier, we're not requiring the COVID vaccine to live on campus housing. In fact, we did not place people based on their vaccination status. Should someone find themselves test positive for COVID, we'll continue to follow our COVID protocol. These pro uh, protocols include temporarily placing a student in a new housing location. And so we'll continue to work in that way. Thanks, Sandy. Um, this question is for Andre Stevens. Uh, if the COVID vac sorry, COVID-19 vaccine is not required for students in the fall, will unvaccinated students be tested regularly for COVID-19? If not, what other measures will be put in place in order to keep all community members safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. At, at this time, we're not planning on doing regular surveillance testing of any students, but certainly we'll conduct symptomatic testing as needed. We will continue to monitor the COVID-19 cases, and uh, if outbreaks uh, occur, we have to determine then if regular testing is needed. Um, in talking with Sarah Templeton, again, director of the health center, she's not here, but um, if, if we do go that route, it is likely that the testing would occur with unvaccinated students. 
Uh, in terms of the measures that are in place, um, again, we will do an education uh, process for students returning to campus. They certainly should stay at home or in their rooms if they're sick or develop, developing COVID-like symptoms. Uh, Sandy mentioned quarantine and isolation spaces have been designated. Uh, regular cleaning uh, and regular cleaning and disinfectants are among the measures uh, that we've implemented to help mitigate the spread of the virus. Thanks, Andre. This next question is for the Associate Vice President and uh, Chief of Campus Safety, John Ojasaskoba, over here to my left. So John, the question is, are alumni allowed to visit campus? We miss visiting Biola and are wondering when the campus will allow visitors. Uh, thank you so much for that question, Brenda. Uh, it's so good to be here and uh, it's going to be real, real special, you know, when uh, we all, you know, here see your faces uh, in just you know, under, you know, eight weeks. Uh, alumni, we do miss you as well. And yes, you know, you're welcome to visit campus at any given time. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> uh, the next question is for Andre. If my student is not vaccinated, what does this mean for him? Uh, what, if anything, will be different for my student? Yeah, thank you. At, at this point, nothing will be different, uh, again, in, in our entry into campus unless there is a, an outbreak. So un, unvaccinated students may have to be tested if there's an outbreak and there may have to be quarantined if they're exposed to someone with COVID or test positive. And this would involve, again, a temporary move from their room to a different building and perhaps not being able to attend class in person for up to 10 days. Great, thank you for that. Uh, this next, next question is for Tammy Anderson. Is in-person study required for next semester? My kid might not be in the state at the time the school begins. Uh, yes, unless a rare exception is granted. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we will be on campus and in person for all traditional programs. This means that students will need to plan accordingly for orientation events and the start of classes. On Monday, August 30th, uh, information is available on Biola's website regarding start dates, as well as other important information pertaining to the university schedule. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, this next question is for President Corey. Would Biola consider a petition to remain open if a variant strand presents itself this fall and threatens closure again of the campus? It is too damaging to the student's spiritual growth and schooling experience with the online format. Parents and students would sign it. Dr. Corey. I'd sign it too. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is an important question. I, I know some of you know this, but we have been at Biola University at the tip of the spear in LA County, pushing to have campuses reopen. Uh, we've talked about that this year. I've been in countless conversations. I chaired an LA County task force on reopening. We've had, like, percentage wise, more students on campus this fall. Uh, or actually this past spring than virtually any other college university in the county. So because we've pushed forward and we're committed to health and safety, uh, we felt like we could do that. We have a voice that's heard, Chief John Ojesikoba, Sarah Templeton, others. Uh, the president of Pomona College and I have led some of the initiatives rallying support for our students returning. So it's, that's the reason why we're doing this. And that was the, the heart of this question. And that is, in the question it said, it is unhealthy for students to be isolated and not in community, and we agree. So if there is a national or a statewide or a county restriction on opening due to a variant strain, I want you to know, my promise, that we will be at the table in those conversations and doing all we can to lead the efforts, maybe even with a petition, to support our students in their healthy and safe return to campus. You know, we'll ultimately we'll have uh, to follow guideline orders. We're gonna do everything within our power to remain fully open and um, just, you know, the government's going to have certain regulations, but we're, we're going to keep on pushing. And I hope this uh, answer helps uh, with that question. Thank you, Dr. Corey. This next question is for Mike On. How will chapel work for students who get permission to continue remote learning? Yeah, thanks. Uh, for traditional undergraduate students who are temporarily approved for fully remote learning, we're going to reach out to you and we're going to explain to you how you can fulfill your chapel, your chapel commitment and we're gonna, again, we're gonna reach out to you and this is only for a handful of students. Yes. So we're gonna reach out to you. Great, thanks Mike. Uh, Tammy, this question is for you. Is there a way to be a remote student in the fall? I am in a complicated situation and I need to be home this next semester for a majority of the time. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I'm sure it's on uh, a lot of people's minds, but pre-pandemic -pre programming is resuming. 
which means students who are not otherwise enrolled in an online program will be expected to return to campus. In the rare situation that might prevent a student from gaining access to campus, for example, an international student, we have developed a process by which each individual case is reviewed and decided. However, I do think it is important to note that the situation such as a, a student not wanting to leave a job they enjoy would not meet the criteria for a rare situation. Uh, accommodations are b uh, being granted based on severe health issues and international travel needs. Students can contact the Learning Center for uh, personal health concerns issues. Students can fill out the form posted in the chat if they have international travel issues. Thanks. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, this one's for Andre. Will the health center be offering the COVID-19 vaccine to students who have not been vaccinated and would like, would like to be so? Uh, yes, so uh, if a student has not been vaccinated yet, the health center will have vaccines available in mid-August. And so feel free to contact the health center to schedule an appointment uh, at that time. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Dr. Corey, uh, the question is, if LA decides to mandate the COVID vaccine for all colleges, what will you do? Yes, you know, like any required vaccine, we're gonna have to follow the law but we also provide exemptions um, where we're legally required to do so. So that's the quick and easy answer for that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Corey. Uh, Sandy, the question is for events going on for students during, during move-in week, which allow for additional visitors on campus, is there a limit to the number of people who can come as well as helping to move into the dorms? At this time, we are welcoming students, families, and supporters to help you move in. We are not placing a limit on the number of people who can help. And in addition, we will have student leaders available to assist with the move-in process, but we are thrilled that we haven't been limited in terms of occupancy. Thank you, Sandy. I have another question for you. Will roommates be required to wear masks while in their dorm room? I prefer they do not, but they're asking. <laughs> I know, we all <laughs> have our preferences. Um, and as Andre has mentioned, and many of us has mentioned, unless the government orders change, we will not require masks for any students. If a student feels more comfortable, and I'm assuming many will feel more comfortable wearing a face covering, that is certainly their choice to do so. Thank you, Sandy. This one's for Andre Stevens. Um, how will Biola control uh, for different variants or strains, particularly if there is no requirement? Uh, again, we encourage students to be vaccinated against COVID-19. That continues to be the best defense from health professionals against uh, the various strains. Additionally, we will be doing symptomatic testing and quarantining of symptomatic residential students. And lastly, we, we are trusting that our students will remain home or in their rooms if they're not feeling well. So there's a number of different things we're doing to help mitigate, again, the spread of the virus. Great, thank you, Andre. This one's for Tammy. Will students have the option to watch live stream of lectures if they are sick or uncomfortable resuming in person? Uh, we are expecting students to attend courses in person, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if not enrolled in an online program. If a student becomes ill, the professor will arrange for their student to get the necessary content. This process is typical to how the university has always functioned. For instance, if a student started the semester and then broke a leg or became seriously ill, um, how the student would keep abreast of the content would depend on the type of course. The professor would work with the student. For example, the professor would handle a lab differently than a lecture course. So all of that would be coordinated between the professor and the student. Thank you, Tammy, for clarifying that. This next question is for Andre. What measures are you putting in place to ensure that students are safe from infection? Thank, thank you, Brenda. So we, we can't promise that students will not get infected. Uh, however, as, we, as I mentioned, we are not requiring students to obtain the vaccine as, as some institutions have. We are strongly encouraging it because again, it is the best way to mitigate the disease. We will continue to offer COVID education to students in terms of healthy practices, and we will continue to upgrade uh, with our upgraded cleaning and disinfection procedures in the campus facilities. I have another question for you, Andre. I understand that uh, not requiring vaccination, but will we be required to be tested for COVID while on campus and what about the flu shot? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, not at this point. Um, I'm not gonna use the word however. I'm gonna use a different word now. No, um, but nevertheless, 
<laughs> if we have low vaccination rates or an outbreak, we may have to test unvaccinated students. So, so some of this will emerge, right, as we get into, into the semester. Uh, and additionally, if the county requires a flu vaccine this year, as they did last year, we would have to require it of our students. Again, we offer exemptions, uh, medical and religious exemptions that students uh, would have to fill out if they didn't want the, the flu vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. You're not off the hook yet. We have one more. L.A. County recommends masking indoors. Are you able to encourage that for students? Yes, I, I, I think, um, again, we, we're not requiring it, but we, we certainly encourage it um, for our students. And, um, and, I, and I mentioned in my opening comments, I think for students, there are a number of students who are immunocompromised or they have family members who are. And so they want to take extra precaution in wearing uh, wearing a face covering. So we certainly want to encourage that and um, and support that for any any student who desires that. Thank you, Andre. One last question before I move on to someone else. Um, <laughs> um, I would like my student to remain masked, but she's nervous that she will stand out if others are unmasked. Are you able to provide a statement for students to feel free about their own health safety so that they will not be looked at differently? Yes. Yeah, so, so a part. I think part of our education again is for students that um, when they come back, they they don't have to, but we encourage them to, and they certainly can voluntarily wear a face covering regardless of their vaccination status, uh, for their own comfort, health and safety, for others' comfort. We're different from K twelve in that we will have students from all over the country, all over the world, coming to our campus, living and learning in close proximity. Some vaccinated, some not and some with differing opinions regarding face coverings. So we want to uh, promote an environment where those in our community who desire to wear face masks can do so without being shamed. Of course, uh, we will, our staff will engage in any allegations of bullying or harassment uh, with appropriate measures. And so I, I, that's a really important question and I want to em emphasize that. We want to be a community of grace um, and support the health and safety of, of our students. Thank you, Andre. Um, Sandy, this question is for you. When do students move into the dorms and how many people are allowed to help? And I know that was answered earlier, but if you can That's clarify. Okay. <laughs> we'll say it again. So incoming students, you're going to be able to move in on Thursday, August 26th. And continuing students can begin moving in on Friday, August 27th. We haven't placed a limit on the number of people who can help a student move in. And so we're just thrilled um, that everybody's going to be returning back to campus. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Chief John, this question is for you. How will quarantines uh, look for the students that test positive for COVID? Yeah, thank you, Brenda. Uh, we have a team uh, in place and a specific plan uh, to care for students you know, who may be, who will need to go into quarantine. Our plan includes the following. One, uh, mail delivery services, which is handled by resident director in close conjunction with uh, manager of the cafeteria. Uh, two, we have a 24-7 student care support team that will provide general care and time-sensitive emergency response. This team is comprised of resident directors and campus safety personnel. Both areas will have vital confidential information such, such as students' room and status in order to be able to respond. Uh, three, daily medical check-ins will be conducted by the team from the health center the purpose of this team is to monitor the student's progress and address any current or emerging issues that arise. Uh, four, the Bio Learning Center. Uh, this team will work directly with professors to help manage students' academic needs while they're in quarantine. Five, the Bio Counseling Center. The Bio Counseling Center will be available you know, to work alongside you know, students as needed. And finally, we have a pastoral care team and this is so important. And this team will be in touch with students you know, to encourage them and to pray with them while they're in quarantine as well. Thanks, John. Um, I think this next question is for you. Also, what will campus look like in the fall regarding masks and social distancing in the classrooms? Well, uh, like we all know, masks are no longer you know, required, you know, outdoors for everyone. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Um, for indoor purposes, though, only unvaccinated employees you know, who are, requir are required you know, to wear a mask you know, at this you know, point in time. We're hoping 
that the spread of the Delta variant slows down so that you know, the county and state you know, does not go back you know, to mandating uh, uh, face coverings uh, indoors like they recently did for elementary you know, schools. Uh, regarding distancing, we are not anticipating the return of distancing protocols in inside classrooms or in campus buildings. Thank you, John. Uh, Andre, will large-scale events be open for unvaccinated students to attend? Uh, yes, we anticipate that to be true. Uh, again, of course, if there's an outbreak um, on, on campus, we'll need to readjust our planning and the implementation of certain activities and events. Uh, but we, uh, all of the events will be inclusive of whether a student is vaccinated or unvaccinated. Thank you, Andre. Um, this one's for Sandy. Uh, when will we be able to have people come into our dorm rooms and apartments, or will it be like last semester where no one was allowed to come into our dorm? We have already implemented back visitors, so if I think they're going to put a link into the chat uh, for you, which attaches to this, the handbook for housing, which gives our open hours and times when people can visit you and come to your room and when that works. So, yes, we are going back to the pre-COVID days um, of visitors and guests on campus. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> um, this next question. Sorry, <clears throat> it's really hot up here. Um, so this next question is for Andre. How would my student go about getting a waiver for wearing a mask because of medical issues? Oh, oh, there's, um, ag again, there's no uh, need to get a waiver because we're not requiring masks for students. Thank you, Andre. Um, this next question is also for Andre. Will students who live in the U.S. and outside of the greater L.A. area be required to quarantine in their dorms, like what happened in the spring? Yeah, so no, students who are coming from outside the U.S. will not have to quarantine. Most students who are coming actually have to take a COVID test before they arrive on campus. Uh, but there's no quarantine. We ask, again, that students who are symptomatic will stay home or in their rooms and will monitor as they transition to campus. Thank you, Andre. Uh, this question is for you as well, Andre. Are there still financial aid funds available for students who have been affected by COVID? Uh, yeah, so we do have some donor-funded funds called Hope in Crisis Scholarships that are available uh, for incoming students. So incoming students, contact your admissions counselor to see if you would qualify for these funds. And then continuing students, if you need additional assistance, you can access a form on our webpage, the tuition and financial aid webpage, or co coronavirus page to appeal for additional funds. Thanks, Andre. Um, and one more question for you. Will students who get jobs on campus be required to wear a mask if they are not vaccinated? Yeah, so, um, and I think Chief John mentioned this, if you are in, an employee of the university, currently Cal OSHA requires um, employees to wear masks while indoors with other people. So if employee is in their own office, um, they don't have to wear masks. But if you're a student employee and you're working in a meeting around other people indoor currently, you would have to wear masks. Thanks for clarifying that. And so, Sandy, the next question is, will there be a parent, Biola parent event on the weekend of student orientation and move-in? Yes, the uh, alumni and parent experiences crew are putting together a schedule for parents and supporters throughout the entire orientation schedule. So we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Andre. Uh, we do not want our son being forced to have unnecessary vaccinations. Our current reading of the policy requires unnecessary vaccinations. Uh, so how do we opt out of COVID or the MMR vaccine or the other vaccines? Yeah, uh, all, all Biola students, except those who are in online-only programs, are required to submit some health forms uh, when you register. So this is a health history, meningitis advisory, TB screening, uh, notice of privacy practices, copy, copy of immunization records uh, that show at least two doses of the MMR. Uh, that has not changed. And again, as we've said, we are not requiring the COVID vaccine but students may request a medical or religious exemption from submitting the required vaccination records. These exemption requests are reviewed and determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Tammy, this next question is for you. Are you considering live streaming or using Zoom in addition to in-person teaching for larger classes 
if some are not comfortable attending in person yet. Thank you, Brenda. That is not our plan as we intend to resume classes in person. Classrooms with large numbers of students are typically held in lecture halls with room to self-select distancing. Also, students can choose to wear masks if uncomfortable. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Sandy, what kind of limitations will there be uh, due to COVID or the variant? Will dorms still be, do be doing big group activities to get to know new people? Just like the classroom, we are at this time resuming all our activities and the housing and residence life team, campus engagement and commuter life teams are already planning for times of connection. We know this has been something that we all have missed and so we're looking forward to those moments as we return to campus. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Andre, the question is, how often will students who are unvaccinated be required to take COVID tests? Thank you, Brenda. At, at this point, we're not doing any surveillance testing. Again, should the need arise because of a rise in cases on our campus or an outbreak, we would implement a thoughtful plan uh, to do some testing. Thanks, Andre. Uh, Chief John, this next question is an important one. Without requiring the COVID vaccine, how will students and faculty stay safe? Well, we do have a compliance task force uh, on campus. And one of the areas you know, that we uh, focus on as a task force is developing methods you know, to keep the community safe. I'll mention just a few. Uh, campus safety you know, will not be policing every step uh, a student and employees you know, take, but we will work with resident directors and the dean to ensure that any established you know, rules are followed. We are also hoping that we all you know, can work you know, together, and that is you know, students, you know, faculty, you know, staff, and hold each other accountable so we can keep our campus safe. What we don't want is that we definitely don't want us uh, we don't want sections of our campus to be shut down, you know, by the county uh, in case, you know, COVID-19 cases continue to increase uh, countywide. Our health center will roll out a revised preventative educational program. Uh, as mentioned by Vice President Andrea, you know, Stevens, our health center will also conduct uh, some surveillance testing, you know, as needed. Cleaning is another, you know, task. I believe, you know, v Vice President Andre Stevens mentioned earlier on. Um, this will continue. We have an excellent crew at our facilities management team. Uh, this team will continue with a high-level cleaning routine. Virus cleaning antimicrobial solution will be applied, you know, to high-touch surfaces, especially inside, you know, buildings. And lastly, we will follow Kyle Osho's mask requirements, you know, for unvaccinated employees. We are actively putting plans in place, you know, to make sure that supervisors across our entire campus take appropriate steps you know, to hold their employees accountable. Thank you, John. Um, this next question is for Sandy. Where are the quarantine beds located on campus? Uh, since most students were not allowed to opt for a single room, if a person gets COVID, what is the procedure so that they may continue working from their room if they are feeling well enough to do so? Yeah, I think Chief kind of answered a lot of that with in terms of our quarantine process and if we have to isolate students. We have held spaces for students should they need to be placed in isolation. And if a student gets COVID, we will work with the health center team and Chief to determine what is best planned for that student. We have established, as he mentioned, a complete protocol, including a meal service. Um, and should a student need to be isolated, we are prepared to support them in any possible way that we need to. Thank you, Sandy. And we got a handful of questions in the live chat. I'm going to ask a couple of them. We have a few minutes. Um, the first one is, Sandy, are there any guidelines or restrictions on, on students being in each other's dorm rooms? No, not at this time. We are continuing, like visitors are welcome. They may um, come into each other's rooms. So it's very different. If, the, if students were here in the spring, I think that's probably what you're imagining. And, and that is not the case. Um, we are resuming to an open campus where students can visit and go amongst one another's rooms. Thank you. And we did have a number of people ask um, the question about that mass. Why, uh, maybe Andre or Chief John can answer this, why are those uh, not vaccinated uh, being required to wear a mask? Yeah, so uh, we can tag team if you want to, Chief, but it's uh, students don't have to wear masks. Again, students don't have to wear masks indoor or outdoor. 
However, again, if you are a student employee, we are, we are regulated by Cal OSHA, which currently, again, not permanently, currently says that if you're an employee indoors, unvaccinated, and you're not in your office, so you're in a meeting with a group of people or you're walking through, you have to wear a mask in that, in that setting. But Chief, would you add anything to uh, that? Not, What's that? While they're working, not yeah. Yes, right, right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Andres, uh, exactly, you know, right. Uh, we're, we're bounded by Carl Osha, uh, and we'll continue to assess. Um, you know, we have a call with the county this coming uh, Thursday. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll learn new information mm -hmm. through that call, mm -hmm. uh, and then hopefully, you know, things will stay exactly in how we have planned. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, this is about student athletes. Uh, they're wondering when, when our student athletes orientation happening uh, if we know that and will students be a part of that as well yes so uh, that is a great question looking forward to having our student athletes back I don't know the date yet um, of student athletes returning and um, I'm sorry about that but we will get that information to you our uh, AD Dr. Bethany Miller Miller has been on vacation for a few weeks I was on vacation for a few weeks but I know there are plans in place to return and support our student athletes and uh, I think pre-COVID, we had parents as well as students, and some of our athletes return early if you're in a fall sport. And so your coach has been already in contact with you. But we will get that uh, to you as soon as we can. Thank you, Andre. And then one, there was a number of questions, so thank you so much. But we can't get to all of them that were submitted um, on the live chat. Uh, but this last question is, is a really important one as well, uh, Chief John. With the rise in crime across the country, what extra steps are being taken to ensure safety on campus? Uh, so uh, we have actually, over the last uh, you know, two months, you know, been tracking what's going on around you know, the, the, the country, uh, around the state, county, even with this, within the city here. Just three weeks ago, uh, I had a meeting with the leadership of the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department here on our very campus. About uh, nine members of their leadership team you know, came to meet with us. Uh, to think ahead, to think proactively about you know, potential issues, you know, uh, because we believe you know, firmly that it's important you know, to talk about these issues, talk with partners you know, outside you know, campus, which is the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, and develop you know, measures. So we are, we are actively you know, developing proactive steps in terms of you know, property-related crimes, in terms of crimes against persons or other types of type of crimes you know, that will traditionally impact, uh, you know, campuses. Uh, so um, when uh, students you know, come back in the uh, you know fall semester, we will have some time you know during orientation you know to share you know some uh, ideas and safety tips on how to keep themselves safe you know both on campus and off campus. Thank you, Chief, for that. Um, and this last question is for Dr. Corey. Um, we did receive a number of questions pre-submitted about Biola's response uh, on issues of race and diversity. And so um, the question is, what is Biola's posture on racial justice and racial reconciliation? Yeah, thanks for this question. And, and I understand there, there were a number of questions that came in uh, on, on this subject, on how we're responding to racial injustices in our nation and our world. I, I could talk about this for quite some time, but let, let me get to the point. You know, as we talk about uh, and, and, and we consider tangible approaches to racial justice and reconciliation, we of all universities really should do so with scriptural eyes wide open. I mentioned a few minutes ago about our earliest vision at Biola. Well, back in 1913 at our groundbreaking, our founder said all people, regardless of race, color, class, creed, previous condition, will ever be welcome to our privileges and the color of one's skin would not mean a different understanding of the word welcome and neither would someone's ethnicity or family background or denominational affiliation or native language or economic status nor the whatever the uniqueness of their story is the word welcome meant welcome mm -hmm. that bio would be about living into a christian hospitality and not living by power dynamics and we've worked hard to make it clear up front and in no uncertain terms that, that we're gonna follow a biblical approach to diversity and, and racial injustices. And we should be the university that's talking about and practicing reconciliation more and not less, more biblically and not less biblically. And, and we need to do so more than just talking. We need to model ways that lead to students cherishing the beauty of deep and abiding reconciliation. And that's the welcoming spirit 
our founders had in mind. And, and we're not about adopting racial justice ideologies guiding many of America's universities. And, and, and we're not about finding a middle ground between competing sides. We're really about a higher ground. And that means we help students understand how to confront injustices of all sorts by first recognizing our identity in Christ above all other identities and then charting a way forward by thinking and acting Christianly. And that's, maybe, that's where we are in a nutshell. We've had a lot of conversations about this, and that's going to continue as we enter this new year. Thank you, Dr. Corey. And that is uh, our time is up for this town hall, but we're going to transition to Todd Pickett, our campus pastor, and just close our time in prayer as we prepare to welcome our students in a few weeks. Good evening, or for some of you, good morning, or for some of you, good afternoon. Uh, or if you're down under, good day. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would normally say let's close in prayer, uh, but I think it's actually more important to say, to say uh, let's reopen in prayer. And Dr. Corey mentioned early on that that's what we've been doing all summer. All the faculty, all the staff, all the executives, we've been reopening in prayer. Um, I'm reminded that Jesus says in John 15, you can do nothing apart from me. And I want to say, well, Lord... <laughs> People do things apart from you all the time. And Jesus was right, as he always is, that, well, you can't do anything that is truly life-giving, spirit-led, transforming in the way that Biola wants to do it. And so that's why we pray. And so I invite you with me to reopen in prayer, uh, both as we approach the reopening of Biola and your visits to our campus, but even right now. So let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we stand before you on the threshold of this new building and on the threshold of this new year. We thank you, Lord, that we can say, uh, like Jacob did in Genesis, truly God is in this place, and it is awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's your Spirit who has watered and nurtured and cultivated this place and allowed us to partner with you for 113 years to send seeds of hope, these students, into the world. And we thank you that you've also had your hand on these students their whole lives. You've guided and borne them to us like gifts, fresh with possibilities, as they should be. Because where your love and power is, well, there is freedom and there is hope and there is vision. So today, as we renew our hearts in Christ, we ask that, Lord, you prepare all of us to be led by the mighty power of your Spirit. Overwhelm us with hope and gladness. Give us discernment to see what is our world today and a vision for the way things might yet be. Water the souls of our staff, our faculty, our students with love and wisdom that, in the words of Biola's founders, from this place may flow streams of living water, which will be a great blessing to the darkest and most thirsty places in the world right around us and beyond. Lord, you've broken open the life of your son that we might crawl inside and become sons and daughters, that you might cry out within us, Abba, who art in heaven. May your name be hallowed in this place. May your will be done here as it is in heaven, that the glory of it all would turn heads and turn hearts to the good news of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank all of you. Thank my colleagues here, Dr. Todd Pickett, Mike Gahn, Sandy Huff. Dr. Andre Stevens, Dr. Tammy Anderson, Chief John Jessicoba, and Brenda Velasco uh, for being part of this conversation today. And thank all of you for participating in this town hall. I hope and I pray that we helped you on your questions. I hope and I pray to see you soon in August in person. Stop any one of us along the way. Introduce yourself. We'd love to meet you for the first time or to see you again. And remember to send your questions that you still might have to internal.communications at Biola dot edu and we will make sure those questions are answered as soon as possible i'm so grateful uh, for each and every one of you thank you god be with you stay safe stay healthy we love you we truly do go now in peace and goodbye for now see you soon